you, Jesus. Completely saturate us, Lord. We just want to honor you and praise you and worship you and give you all the praise and the glory. Lord, I ask that you teach us how to worship you more. That we'd never be spectators, Lord. That you teach us longevity and worship when we're at home alone. Just privately coming into that intimate place, that secret place with you, Lord. That we'd never be satisfied for a few minutes here and there or for CD worship alone at, at home or wherever we are, Lord. Or having to need a band. Because, Lord, you've called us and made us worshipers. It's who we are. It's who we are, Jesus. And we just love you. We just love you, Lord. And we take this opportunity to worship you, Lord. To honor you, Lord. And all those years where we didn't worship before, Lord, forgive us. Teach us, Lord, how to worship you. Praise your name, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. Jesus, I love you.
love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord. Oh, God, I love you, Lord. Oh, I love you, Lord. Oh, I love you, Lord. Oh, I love you, Lord, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just need to teach a little bit about worship for a second. So sometimes we come up here and the band is doing something and sometimes people can enter in and sometimes they don't. And a lot of times people don't know what to do. <laughs> And that's just really from lack of practice, to be honest with you. And so sometimes what happens is, well, this is what happens. So we'll start singing something, and in my spirit, it's like, yes, this is what's happened. This, this is it. This is it. And we just keep singing that thing or playing that part or whatever it is because there's an anointing on it for whatever reason. Because sometimes it's like we're just saying one word or we're singing one sentence. And that doesn't matter to God. If it mattered, the elders wouldn't say, holy, 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 24-7. That's all they're saying. It's not really the amount of words that we use. It's that when God anoints something, we all need to be participators. And so if we're here in a congregational setting, and we begin just to actually connect with the words and not just say things, or not just wait until, oh, that part's over, because they're just saying the same sentence over and over again. But actually... As a team and as a group, everyone just begins to enter in, just begins to kind of jump on board the same, the same bandwagon. Suddenly, corporate worship takes on a whole new level. So it's not because we don't sing the same thing over and over again because it's like, oh, um, we can't find any other words. We can. There's always other words. We sing the same thing when Holy Spirit has anointed it. And he wants to move through it. And we're just to be obedient vessels. It doesn't matter. One of the things the Lord has done in me is, you know, I'm a psalmist. I can write songs. It's not about all the words, though. It's about allowing him to lead. And so right now, you know, we were just singing, I love you. And you don't even have to sing it. That's the beauty about worship. It's really the connection, that intimacy with the Father. And you just say those things and, Every time you say it, you just say it with more meaning almost. And suddenly God takes you into a place that you never thought you could go. And it's not something that can be explained with words. It's like a positioning of your heart. And I believe the Lord does want to take us there corporately. That we wouldn't be spectators. That we wouldn't just phase out or fade out or just wait till this section is over. but that we'd all participate, we'd all enter in. You know, when it's time to be quiet, that we'd be quiet. When it's time to sing, that we'd sing. When it's time to shout, that we'd shout. When it's time to dance, that we'd dance. And just allow him to lead us. So right now, we're just going to try that little section again. We're going to say, I love you. But every time you say it, I want you to think about the Lord. And don't let your mind wander. Tell him like he's standing right there in front of you, right with you, because he is. And then just allow him to wash over you, because that's what he wants to do. 
Jesus. And like I said, you don't have to sing it. You can just say it, but just keep saying it. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Say it like you mean it. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, I love you. I love you, Lord.
Jesus. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, it's all about your love. We worship you. Oh, we build our lives on your Lord and on your truth. Oh Jesus, we worship you.
Hallelujah, Jesus. We sing praises to your name because you're worthy of praise, Jesus. You alone, you alone. You're worthy of all the worship. You're worthy of everything that we can offer up to you. Father, we don't with our minds fully understand everything we need to understand about worship. But yet, your word gives us so much information about worship, we cannot deny its value. So I thank you, Father, that you've promised to inhabit our praises. That means you're here, and you are going to minister to every person in this place and wherever people are watching to the extent we allow you to do so. So thank you for tonight, Father. Thank you ahead of time for your will being accomplished. And Jesus, we give praises to your name for you alone are worthy. Hallelujah. Let's sing that one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. I sing praises to your name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Your name is great, worthy to be praised. Oh. Hallelujah. Glory and honor to your name, Jesus. Praise you. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Glory to you, Jesus. Bless your name, Lord. Praise you. Praise you. Praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm glad I'm born again. I would not want to live any other kind of life than this one that God has given me. It is an adventure. You know that 
that story, Alice in Wonderland, all kinds of crazy weird things happen. You know what? Being born again is kind of like we're in a wonderland of God's presence. Praise the Lord. Why don't you get around and greet some people? Shake some hands. Those of you watching, do the same thing. Well, good evening. You guys just keep looking better and better. Don't know how to explain it. Something's working. Well, we were going to have a folding party tonight after the church, after the service. But Cindy, she just put her little fingers, her, her little Cindy fingers to work. She folded all those letters. So then we were going to have a glue them shut party tonight. But Free and Gloria got down there this afternoon. They glued and glued and glued and glued and glued. And they got them all glued. So that means we're not going to have a folding party. We're not going to have a glue them shut party. So I get an extra half hour to preach. Ha, 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 ha. I'm joking, yeah. Hallelujah. Not really. Not really. Thank you guys for doing that. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Praise God. Would you please open to Psalm chapter 19, verse... Well, just open to Psalm 19. I'll tell you what verse when you get there. Psalm 19. Psalm, that's in the Old Testament, by the way. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord, or we could say the, the word of the Lord, is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And again, that word simple, the unknowledgeable, the uh, you know, those maybe not as educated in the Word, and the Word gives you, you know, it teaches you. You grow. Well, look in Psalm 119. Similar verse. Psalm 119. In verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple or it giveth discernment it giveth perception it giveth insight it giveth understanding unto the simple the body of Christ is supposed to be stable now how many of you have ever maybe you sat down you crossed your legs and your leg went to sleep. And then when you stand up, your leg just feels weird. You know, it just kind of, it just won't do anything. It kind of flops around and whatever. Well, your leg's kind of unstable. The body of Christ is not supposed to be unstable. Now, <laughs> I saw a video of a church service. Preacher is up there talking about Jesus. And I, I didn't see the whole, well, the video was not of the entire service, but it was of enough. And in this service, he was, well, I'm not going to try to go into everything, but basically what he did, there must have been, I don't know, three, four hundred people maybe, and a whole bunch of them were up front like an altar service or something? Well, anyway, long story short, he told them to go outside the church and eat the grass. Yeah. And so I'm watching this, and it was like a stampede. Those people ran outside and fell down on all fours and started eating grass. Some of them were grabbing handfuls and shoving it in their mouth. And I'm watching this, and I kid you not, as I'm watching it, I started gagging. 
I mean, I started having that don't look anymore, okay, feeling. So I kind of looked away, and then that settled down. I looked back again and, you know, watched a little more, and then I looked away again. Honestly, it was, I'm starting to feel sick in my stomach watching this. Well, not only that, but this pastor also has had people in the congregation <laughs> drink gasoline in the service, um, he has had, during the service, women stripped naked. And there was a video clip of that. It didn't show them naked, but it showed them working on it. And he's also had people in the church swallow live snakes. Now, I'm not making this up. And so the guys, he, he'll tell you about Jesus. Jesus. But then this stuff's going on. <clears throat> well, what I found out is that um, apparently some people just thought he was a little too weird. And I can't say that they were acting in love, or, but they, they beat him up and he burned his church down. And I got to say, part of me's thinking he, he got what he deserved. But beating people up is not the answer. Although burning down the church might have helped. But the thing is, you know, we can talk about, well, that guy is weird. Where has he come up with this stuff? I don't know. But I'll guarantee you somehow, some way, he's going to pull something out of Scripture and use it to prove his point. But of greater concern are the people who continue attending that guy's church. That's weird. And we might come up with a question such as, who in their right mind would keep going to something like that? And that's a fair question. Who in their right mind would keep going to something like that? No one. That means the people going to it, they're not in their right mind. And in part of the clip, one of the videos, some of the people, what they were doing was weird. And I will go so far as to say, no doubt in my mind, some demons were involved. And you might think, well, how in the world can demons show up when somebody's up there telling you about Jesus? Oh, it's easy. It, it, it goes on more than maybe what you'd think. Well, here we are tonight, we're thinking, ah, you never pull me in on that one. You're not, I'm not going to eat grass. You know, we'll go get a lawnmower or a few billy goats, but I, I'm not going to be the one to eat some grass. I'm not going to do this and, you know, keep those snakes away from me and so on and so forth. You're right. We wouldn't do that. But we had here several years ago a preacher who... Uh, he had been here on two different occasions, two prior occasions, had preached in several services, everything seemed okay. But then, he's ministering to people who, are believe, who want healing for their bodies. This one person had a terminal diagnosis, so he prays for that person, the person falls down on the floor, and I'm just going to say, okay, I concede, we'll just say it was the Holy Spirit. But then the preacher stood over him and started doing this. He said, I mix your blood with the blood of Jesus. I mix your blood with the blood of Jesus. Right there. Right there. That's where it happened. Well, I had to deal with that later. Um, but the sad thing is, while that was going on, there were people in the congregation that seemed to be flowing with it. And so, who in their right mind would flow with that? People who don't know any better. You see, it's, it's very easy to be influenced by a preacher. Very easy. Because what we do, even if we don't mean to, we take preachers, people who stand behind a pulpit, and we immediately put them up on a pedestal. Some are higher pedestals than others. But we do that. 
Now, I understand we're supposed to respect, you know, the pastor in the church. I understand that. I get it. However, you don't toss reason out the window. And so this preacher, you know, he was saying that. Now, some people might say, well, yeah, but I mean, come on, Jesus shed his blood. Well, he did. But now listen closely to me and don't get all mad and throw things at me or send me nasty emails. Jesus did not shed his blood for our healing. The shed blood was for the remission of sins. Okay? Nowhere in the Bible can you find the word blood and the word heal in the same verse. Or the word blood and the word heals. Or the word blood and the word healing. Or the word blood and the word healings. Now you will find the word blood and the word healed in two places. And both of those places are in reference to the lady with the issue of blood. And the Bible says that she was healed of that sickness. But it doesn't say anything about the blood of Jesus. Nothing. In other words, in Scripture, there is no verse anywhere which connects the blood of Jesus to healing. But there is a verse that says, by his stripes, you were healed. All right? And there is a verse that says, God sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. But yet, there are Christians who are going to teach you that if you want healing, you must plead the blood. No. If you want healing, why not plead the stripes? Because that's what Scripture says. And yet, in spite of the fact, there is absolute... Now, okay, I get it. The stripes were laid on his back. He bled. All right? I understand that. Not refuting that. But, if somebody stands up, and they start telling you, you were healed by the blood of Jesus. Well, what exactly do you mean by that? Because if you want to be a stickler for Scripture, by Jesus' stripes, you were healed. Now, I understand the general concept of, you know, Jesus shed his blood for the full atonement and restoration of humanity, which would include healing. I understand that. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where someone is using a biblical truth in an unbiblical manner. Was the blood of Jesus shed? Yes. But you can't stand and pray for somebody or you know, wave your hand over them or whatever and say, I mix your blood with the blood of Jesus. That's voodoo stuff, man. That's weird. That, that's not of God. But I'm telling you right now, you've got Christians out there who are going to believe that and probably try it. And that's weird. Now look over in Job 38. Job 38. In Job 38, <clears throat> verse 31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion. Now, Pleiades and Orion, you know what those are? Those are constellations, all right? Groupings of stars up in space. The same preacher that was mixing the blood of Jesus with the blood of that person also stood in here and said, if you have wayward children, in rebellion to God. Give me their names. Write down their names and their dates of birth. And my prayer team will break the powers of the stars over their lives. This was the verse that he was using to support that. Okay, now. Can thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? All right, is that talking about breaking the powers of stars over children or adults or your dog or your cat or anybody else? 
in context. Go back. This chapter, verse 1. Because what's happening, God has been sitting and listening to Job and his buddies, you know, go through their sob stories. And, you know, blaming God for this. And, I mean, it was, it's just, you know, God just sat back and he let them go on and on and on until they dug a hole so deep there's no way they're going to get out. Then God steps in and he says, excuse me, verse 1. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Well, for one, that preacher that was telling people to eat grass. And the preacher that was saying, I'll mix your blood with the blood of Jesus. Who is this that darkeneth, darkeneth, darkeneth? You see this? Darkeneth counsel. This is what happens when people just accept whatever they hear. Counsel is darkened. And he says, darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge. And he says, gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? And then if you jump over to, um, well, make it simple. Jump over to chapter 40. Moreover, the Lord answered, in other words, he goes through chapter 38, chapter 39, and he's saying, hey, did you do this? Can you do that? Were you there when I did this? Were you there when I did that? Can you replicate what I've done? And in chapter 40, verse 1, moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord, wised up, and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Good move, Job. You know, uh, speak no evil. So after two chapters of God calling Job to account, and it's all about what God has created, Job, he finally realizes, all right, you know what? I'm just going to shut up right about now. But what I'm getting at is this whole thing of verse 31, chapter 8, uh, chapter 38, can you, you know, bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades, loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? And so what God is saying is, can you change the orbital patterns of the, the heavenly bodies, the planets, the stars? Can you change it? Can you alter what's happening up there? The answer is no. This has nothing to do with, ah, uh, we will bind the powers, break the powers of the stars over your children. Well, you see, if you just sit and think about that, how in the world did a star, an inanimate object, get power in the first place? How can something that's, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles away reach across the universe and influence and control my child. Now that's just plain weird. And yet there, this guy believed it. He had a prayer team that believed it and he was convincing people to believe it as well. And they were doing it. And, you know, in fact, we even had people in here. They're writing down the names and dates of their children's births. I had to correct that as well. And I sit back and I scratch my head. Why in the world did you believe such a thing? Now the way I'm presenting it, it sounds so silly. But by the time a sermon is over, depending upon how that sermon is presented, some people will be pulled into believing these things. You know, you think about the whole concept of uh, once saved, always saved. The teaching that says, well, once you're born again, there's no way you can ever become unborn again. No way you can ever go to hell. But you know what? If you just pay attention to Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, you'd realize that's not true. 
Because God created Adam, he was perfect. He lived in a perfect world. And he had God's perfect life. God breathed into him the breath of life, or released his life into Adam. Adam didn't become deity, but he had the life and nature of God. Well, we know what happened in Genesis 3. Adam made a decision, and that led to the downfall of all creation, including all humanity. Now, if it's true that when we're born again, somehow, some way, that born-again life makes it impossible for us to make a decision, a choice, to walk away from God, then Adam has every right to look God eyeball to eyeball and point his finger in God's face and say, why did you hold back on me? Why are you giving them something you did not give me? Because if you had given to me what you gave them, I would never have been able to choose to eat the fruit. You follow what I'm saying? Well, God didn't give us anything better, if you will, than what he gave Adam. In other words, God didn't have a life that he gave to Adam, but then he held back the better life until Jesus could show up, and then he would give us something greater, more powerful than what he gave Adam. That is crazy. We have the same life and nature as Adam because it comes from God. And so therefore, if I choose to eat the fruit, you know what I'm talking about, you know what I mean, if I make a decision to go against God, I can do it. Now, I all suffer consequences, but I can still make that decision. Well, this is leading me up to something you guys may have read about. And uh, it's something that I don't know how new this teaching is, but it could have a dire impact on a whole lot of people. And the teaching is this. Um, in fact, what was written, there was a lady in a church service, and there was a deliverance preacher who was ministering. He wasn't a pastor, he was a guest speaker. But he's up there preaching. And he was saying that chiropractic care is demonic. Now the reason he said that is because the, the originator, the, what you might call the father of chiropractic care, is Daniel David Palmer. Now this goes back, you know, 100 years plus. And, well, maybe not quite 100, but anyway, Daniel David Palmer, he, um, he was a teacher, and he, had, he did some other stuff, but he was also a spiritist. In other words, he believed you could communicate with spirits, okay, some weird stuff. And he said that, <laughs> that this... This, um, the spirit of Dr. Jim somebody appeared unto him and explained to him the basics of chiropractic care. Well, that Dr. Jim whatever, he'd been dead for like 50 years. But yet he shows up to this guy. Now, we know that didn't really happen. But that's what this Palmer guy said. And the story goes that uh, he was in his office or something, and there was a man in there who was doing some work, and uh, the guy was deaf, or, or almost totally deaf. But anyway, uh, the, this Palmer guy looked, and he saw that the man, something was wrong with his back. He says, what happened to your back? And the guy communicated either by writing, or maybe he could kind of mouth the words or something, but he said, well, I was doing some work the other day, and I bent over and did twisted wrong and something popped in my back and ever since then I've been deaf. And so Palmer said, well, what, lay down here like that. And so he did some adjustments on the guy's back and got the part of the spine that was like misaligned. He got it back in line and the guy said, hey, I can hear. Now, some people refute that story. Some people say it actually happened. Nobody refutes 
that Palmer did something to that guy, you know, to do something to his back. Okay, now, when it comes to that whole concept of chiropractic is demonic, the thinking behind it is, if you go to a chiropractor, that chiropractic treatment is traced all the way back to a man who communicated with spirits, demons. And so therefore, this, this whole thing of chiropractic is demonic, and if you have been going to a chiropractor, you need deliverance. Seriously, now apparently in that service, a whole bunch of people flooded the front who had been to chiropractors so they could get delivered. Uh, from what? You know, I, I guess if you go to a chiropractor, apparently demons get in you somehow. I don't know. I don't know. But let's think about this. What, what, is, what does a chiropractor do? Well, a chiropractor works primarily on your back, right? Now, if you go online, you're going to find some people, they're going to tell you chiropractic stuff is quackery. Other people are going to tell you, no, there's scientific evidence for the fact that it helps. You can believe whatever you want to believe. The bottom line is this. Chiropractors will help you as far as your back is concerned. Now, has anybody here ever had like a finger, wrist, shoulder, whatever, um, out of joint, you know, get dislocated? Anything? All right. Now, if, if your shoulder's dislocated, what does the doctor do? The doctor wants to get it relocated, right? Every joint in your body has the possibility to be dislocated. That includes your spine. If you've ever seen a spine, you have all these little connections, all right? All the, the vertebrae and all this other. So it's possible for there to be a misalignment, just like with your feet, just like with all other parts of your body. And so a chiropractor works to get that back in line. There is nothing demonic about realigning the body. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And a chiropractor is not going to impart demons to you by, you know, doing their thing to you, whatever. You know, for me personally, I was battling a leg and hip issue for quite a while. And I never said anything about it. But it hurt. I mean, there was pain. And Kathy thought that, well, I think you have sciatica. It's like, I don't, you call it whatever you want to call it. The bottom line, it hurts. So finally, I went to a chiropractor. And I went to him, it was like, I think, two times a week for about three weeks or whatever. And he worked on me and stretched and all this other kind of stuff. It went away. It went away. That hip problem went away. Now, some people would say, well, how come you didn't trust the Lord? Well, I did trust the Lord. I did. I called my hip healed. However, guys, <laughs> the human body needs attention. You, you know, it's not glorified yet. It's got problems. Well, that's a bad confession. No, that's a Genesis 3 truth. It's got problems. But now right along with this... <clears throat> This um, deliverance preacher also went on to tell people that if they used essential oils for anything, that too was demonic. I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Now, I don't know who this guy is. I contacted the person that wrote the article. I don't know the name of this preacher. Uh, maybe you do. I don't. But that's just some weird stuff. So now this, this guy was saying, you know, you can't be using essential oils. And my question would be, okay, why not? What's the problem with using essential oils? Because, let's think for a moment. Where do the oils come from? They don't come from my car. <laughs> essential oils 
come from plants. All right? Where did the plants come from? God. Therefore, when God created the plants, trees, bushes, shrubs, if it grows, when God created that, all these things, the oil came with it. You understand this? The oil is there. So then, if I'm using essential oils to help promote healing, then I'm using what God put on the planet. Now, don't get weird and start thinking, oh, dude, man, <laughs> if I can use plants to feel better... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I'm going to go roll some and feel really good. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> I'm going to see my own spirits. Hallelujah. <laughs> no. Listen, think about this. Um, the man who's considered the father of modern medicine is Hippocrates. Now, he lived from uh, like 460 to 370 B.C. Well, back then, they didn't have medicine. It didn't exist. The only thing they had, plants, herbs, oils, that's it. That's all they had. In fact, prescription drugs as we know them did not really come into existence until the mid to late 1800s. Prior to that, we didn't have it. So, <laughs> what if we find out that Hippocrates talked to spirits? Does that mean we completely eliminate the whole field of medicine? Seriously? Because if he was a devil worshiper and he talked to devils and he's considered the father of modern medicine, then isn't there the same trickle-down effect like there would be for chiropractic? Well, see, we'd think, oh, that's just plain old goofy and weird, Brother Martin. That, you know, no, we're not going to get rid of all the, the plants and the doctors and everything else. I mean, th there's a reason for this. That's right. There is. And there's nothing demonic about it. But you've got Christians who are grabbing hold of this now. And they are jumping on this bandwagon and not even thinking about what they're doing. Now, I know that, um, like peppermint oil, for example, a lot of people use peppermint oil, just open up the little bottle when they start to battle a headache and just breathe the fumes from the peppermint oil, headache goes away. A lot of people who battle migraines, that's the first thing they go to, peppermint oil, because it works. Peppermint oil also helps to clear up your sinuses. I've used it. I've taken peppermint oil uh, when I've battled like congestion or whatever, and I just, you know, rub it underneath my nose and go to bed. It works. It works. Does that mean that I'm inhaling devils? <laughs> Ooh, there's a big one. Ooh. <laughs> That's nuts. These oils were there to help us. Now, granted, I do understand this that the way that this is, uh, the way that we refine the oils now, they're more concentrated than what they were a long time ago, but yet they're still the same oils, and people still use them for the same reason. Um, in, you don't have to turn to this, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you can write it down, look at it later, that whole chapter, Paul dedicates it to, is it okay to eat meat? that is a result of an animal sacrificed unto a pagan god. And Paul is saying, yeah, because it's meat. I mean, it's just meat. You're not worshiping that god. You're having a barbecue. It's no big deal. In fact, over in 1 Timothy, well, let's do look at this one, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. You know, there are a lot of people out there, Christians now, who really get, let's just say they get interesting when it comes to this whole thing of what you eat. 
in 1 Timothy chapter 4, um, in verse 1, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, okay, what's the result of that? Well, they're going to be speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. <coughs> For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Now, that means that as much as I do not like to eat shrimp and other weird-looking creatures that crawl around in, in the ocean. And I'm not that big on seafood, okay? But it's not wrong to eat it. I mean, I think it's weird to eat it, but it's not wrong to eat it. <laughs> and, and you want to eat liver? Good heavens. That's, you know, I can't... Liver and onions? I mean, seriously. That, that is just one of the worst combinations I've ever heard of. Liver and onions. I'm not going to eat organs. Or pianos. <laughs> Liver and onions. <laughs> or, 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 or. <laughs> the point I'm making is this. You've got people out there, Christians, who jump on the bandwagons of, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other, and yet, Scripture refutes these teachings. And this is very important. See, just because witches and devil worshipers, and mediums, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, those kind of people, just because they use candles and powders and oils and, and the stuff they do, their incantations and their spells and all that, well, does that mean that, bless God, I better not burn a candle in my house? Who knows what kind of devil that will attract? Don't you be using that powder now. Oh, don't you use those oils. You follow what I'm saying? Just because they use that stuff doesn't make it wrong. Listen, God's the one that created all this. God's the one that he set all this in motion <coughs> and he created this world for his children. It's not his fault if some people get weird and use it for the wrong stuff. But it's, this is ours. This is our planet. This is ours. So we can eat stuff. Hey, here's one. This is interesting. Heard this the other day. Checked it out. Briefly checked it out. Apparently, poisonous snakes, um, I think one in particular was the western rattlesnake I read about. Who in the world ever thought to do this? I have no idea. Took, I don't know how many snakes, put them in a hyperbaric chamber. <laughs> you know what a hyperbaric chamber is? It, it's a chamber that's like super, super oxygenated. And I don't know how long they left them in there, but after the period of time they were left in there, their venom was tested, and it was no longer a threat to people. I have no idea how in the world anybody thought of that one. Now, that doesn't mean I'd still want the thing to bite me. <laughs> However, if that's as true as the initial findings seem to indicate, then that is more proof of what of the horrors of Genesis chapter 3. See this? Okay, now. If we take this whole concept of chiropractic is of the devil because the first guy to do it said he got the understanding of it because he saw the spirit of a dead doctor. How many of you guys have ever had dreams and somebody's in the dream that maybe like a, a relative who's been dead? They say, well, now, was that a devil? No, it's a dream. Come on. Or maybe somebody you haven't seen since third grade. It's like, where'd this person come from? You know? No, the brain, just, the brain just comes up with some strange things when you go to sleep at night. And it's not all demonic. But this whole thing of, well, you know the guy that 
came up with chiropractic. He, uh, he, he talked to spirits, and he went to these spiritist conventions, which he did. So therefore, you know, we can't go to chiropractors because it's demonic, and you need deliverance if you go. All right, well, let's carry, let's carry that thought over to some other things. On November 8, 1895, Wilhelm Röntgen, a German scientist, discovered what we now refer to as the X-ray. You know, the doctor says, well, we're going to send you and get you an X-ray, all right? He's the guy that discovered it. What if he was a devil worshiper? Does that mean we, we never again get X-rays? Because when they're doing the X-ray, it might, you know, beam some devils into us. When you go to the dentist, don't you let them X-ray your mouth. Because you'll get devil mouth. Just don't you do it. You know. So do we eliminate that? No. We wouldn't think of it. And what about um, the Wright brothers? What if they talk to spirits of dead people? Does that mean we never get in another airplane? What about Henry Ford? What if Henry Ford you know, was really into some weird stuff and and he sacrificed frogs to the moon god. Does that mean that we no longer use our vehicles? Does that mean we have to get rid of them? You know, burn them, blow them up? See, that kind of stuff is weird. And, And we all laugh at something like that. But yet, you've got Christians out there, if they heard that Henry Ford was a devil worshiper, They wouldn't get rid of their cars. But because a preacher convinced people that chiropractic care is demonic, and the reason it's demonic is because the guy who came up with it was a spiritist. Now all of a sudden, we need deliverance. Well, if Henry Ford was a spiritist, then I guess every time I come to church, I need deliverance because I rode in a car. Makes no sense. As Christians, we have to use, you know, people say use common sense. We have to use biblical sense. And too many Christians aren't doing it, and they just sit back and they listen to something, and man, they just go with it. You know, wow, it makes sense to me. Well, it doesn't make sense to me. If you just stop and think about some of these things, it does not make sense whatsoever. But remember the Bible talks about preachers with great swelling words, you know, deceiving the minds of the simple, all right? The entrance of God's word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So therefore, I need to establish in me the foundation of the word of God. So if I'm in a service and somebody starts teaching some of these weird things, then I'll know immediately This is not true, and possibly get up and walk out. Why should I sit and listen to that weirdness? And you got a whole congregation in at least one church, or maybe not the whole congregation, but part of a congregation in one church, the great swelling words convinced them to stampede out the door of the church, drop down on the ground, and start eating grass. Pull up handfuls of grass, start shoving it in their mouth. Gross. No biblical sense whatsoever. Absolutely none. Now, this is silly stuff. But it's not. Because there are people that believe these things. So that means it's more serious than what we realize. And in in fact, there's a possibility that the day may come, you may encounter a Christian who will tell you, going to a chiropractor, is of the devil. So what are you going to say? You're going to tell them to get this sermon and listen to it. I already know what you're going to (laughs) say. See, when you're founded on the word of God, you're going to know how to give an answer for what you believe. And I do not believe that using essential oils is going to introduce me to a host of demons. That, there's just no way. And I do not believe that going to a chiropractor to help keep my body lined up 
is going to introduce me to demons. It's not going to happen. And besides that, <laughs> you telling me, now think with me for a moment, if chiropractic really was demonic and Jesus went to a chiropractor, do you think that a demon could be imparted to him? Let's think now. I hope, I hope you're not sitting there thinking, well, I don't know. I, <laughs> there's no way, if anything, Jesus would walk in, the devils would run. That's the way it's supposed to be for us too, guys. Perfect love hath no fear. We have no reason to be afraid of these things. Oh, there's, there's stuff out there now, real stuff of the devil. It's there. But we have no reason to be afraid of it because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And Jesus Christ has given us authority over all things of the enemy. Glory to God. I will walk in victory and enjoy my chiropractic adjustment. Hallelujah. <laughs> Please stand. <laughs> Father, I ask you to continue to minister to us in the area of strange doctrine, that we will not get caught up in it no matter what it is, no matter how silly it seems or no matter how real it, it seems, that, Father, we will be firmly established on the foundation of your pure truth, and it will work as a sentry to guard us against this junk. Now, Father, this preacher that's preaching these things, I just pray for him right now. I don't know how many other preachers are preaching this. I don't know how many Christians have bought into it. But, Father, you know, please forgive them. And, Father, whatever it takes, may their eyes be opened to see the truth, and then may they embrace it. I thank you for this, Father. I thank you. And, again, I thank you that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. I praise you for fully manifested healing in our bodies. You're the one that's made this possible, and the glory goes to you, Jesus. And as we leave tonight, Father, I thank you again for being here and ministering to us. And Jesus, you're all we need. Thank you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, if you have an offering tonight, go ahead and bring it up before you leave, and you guys enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you again.